Hello, welcome to this month's CCAG Public Broadcast. Now, as we come to the end of summer in the Northern Hemisphere, we must once again take stock of the toll of extreme weather events. Extreme weather events whose intensity and frequency is increasing due to human-caused climate change. Now, as we also, we also need to look at the political landscape searching for signs of decisive action on climate change from our leaders. You know, it's hard to believe that even with everything that we know about climate change, new gas and oil fields, such as Rosebank here in the UK, are still being approved. That previously cast iron commitments are being rolled back or scrapped. That leaders of some of the world's largest economies have simply failed to show up to critical climate talks. Because the reality is this, the gathering climate crisis will touch every aspect of all our lives, both in the global north and the global south, from our food systems to our ways of life, to the places that we all call home. And perhaps nowhere is more vulnerable and more of a contributor to climate change than our cities and towns. So this month, CCAG released a new report in partnership with urban partners about the role urban centers can play in tackling climate change. Global cities, globally cities of every type, from the well-established capitals of the global north to the fast-growing mega cities of the global south, are facing up to the growing impacts of climate change. Wildfires, floods, drought, hunger, displacement, conflict. Cities are on the front line of the climate crisis. Therefore, the funding, planning and development of cities must all point in the same direction. And that is towards building climate resilience. And guess what? Here's the good news. We know what to do. Solutions already exist to create safe, prosperous cities for citizens everywhere. All we simply have to do is the work. Today, we're going to explore what this work looks like. Now, I think this will be a very exciting session because what we're going to discuss today is about our future. It's about a clear vision. And most importantly, it's about hope. I'm delighted to welcome our panel of CCAG experts alongside our guests today. Our guests, we have our Daffa Pradita, climate activist and national coordinator of Fridays for Future Indonesia. Sada Shafikul Alam, coordinator of the Urban Climate Change Program. Rasmus Grossen Olsen, Head of Sustainable Finance at Urban Partners, and uh, Rochetta Ozane, founder of Louisiana's Vessel Project. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, um, first of all, I want to invite Sir David King, CCAG Sir David King, to begin our discussion with a few opening remarks on the importance of cities in our challenge against the climate crisis. You know, so Dave, we often talk about what is happening, what, what, what's happening to the climate, but what is the importance of cities? What's the important role that cities play? And why was it so important for CCAG to put out this really powerful uh, report? Thank you very much, Ade, and thank you for that introduction. This report, I think, is one of the most important reports we have produced because basically our cities are where the population of the world is rapidly moving to. Uh, we know that throughout the world, the growth of our cities is simply growing faster. And the opportunity, therefore, is as that growth occurs, we must, as Ad has just been saying, develop resilience in a way that means we are looking at the climate science to tell us what the challenges are for different parts of the world and what needs to be done. 
We, we report in this uh, very important report, we report on four cities in particular, and we make uh, no comparisons, just drawing what is being done in each of these cities. So for example, New York and Shanghai, uh, and in New York, they are developing a program to manage rising sea levels. And this program really follows from Hurricane Sandy uh, back in 2012. So they are developing a strategy, the city fathers, and we have talked to people in, in the mayor's office about this. Um, the, the US Army Corps of Engineers, for example, came in with a plan which was to build a wall around the city between eight foot and 20 foot high, and the city fathers, no surprise here, didn't really like that plan. Uh, building a wall like that would change the character of the city very dramatically. So they are looking at alternatives. In Shanghai, they have for very many years been facing up to flooding. They now have the biggest uh, water pumps in the world, keeping Shanghai dry. And this is a critical part of what they're doing. But they also have developed a, a policy, which means that they look at the worst possible challenge to their city going forward in time. And the Chinese are always looking happily well into the future, beyond 100 years. Look at the worst risks that could happen to their city from potential flooding. What needs to be put in place to manage that worst risk? And then to have a staging of getting to that plan in full operation. In other words, you can stop the staging at any point depending on how much sea level has risen. Now, I think that's a, a rather clever plan because it means that there's, there's no problem that they can't manage going forward. They can always retrofit what they've already put in place. Um, and of course, putting up walls is an essential part for defending a city of this kind. I think if we uh, uh, also say that we looked at uh, Jakarta and Dakar to look at uh, two very different cities. Um, we, we find that uh, Dakar in uh, Bangladesh is, is one of the better prepared parts of the world. And the reason it's better prepared is because they've already had to face up to massive challenges. And uh, Ade, you've spent a good bit of time in that part of the world. And the, the film that you made is critically important, demonstrating what already has been achieved in creating resilience in a country which is so challenged by rising sea levels. Um, and, and so the city of Dakar has got a very rapidly growing population, and the, the city can't really contain this population. It is a real problem. But they are determined to see that they have a strategy for resilience. Uh, in Indonesia, the city of Jakarta, the capital, they have stated that they're going to have to move the capital to higher ground. And now this is quite controversial because the higher ground is in Borneo. And uh, Borneo, as we know, is a center of biodiversity. And quite clearly, putting the capital into Borneo is going to challenge the biodiversity that exists in that part of the world. Um, but looking back at Jakarta, this very large sprawling city, uh, the northern part of the city is now under seawater. The northern part of the city is now under seawater. So this is a city very much under challenge. We don't, we're not aware of a plan to deal with this 15 million people that may well all be displaced over the coming few decades. So every city, in the world needs to put in place plans that can manage the challenges that we're faced with, particularly with rising sea levels, but there are many, many other challenges that cities are faced with. Each city, there's no general plan that can be put in place. Each city, each urban area is faced with different challenges. Uh, let me take you to India, Calcutta, often flooded with seawater, and then on the other side of India, Mumbai, the, the financial center of, uh, of India. Each of these cities very close to sea level, and each of them subject to severe flooding. We need to see that all countries, all mayors are aware that they must put in place resilience plans. Thank you, Sir Dave. That's, um, that was an excellent opener and really, really insightful. I mean, cities have to change you know quite literally 
we're, we're talking about capital cities even having to move in order to deal with um, with the climate crisis. Um, and this report, I think, is so powerful and 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 it's so important the the kind of knowledge and information that it's going to give to us and give to governments and our leaders in order to enact that change. So once again, thanks. Thank you very much to Dave uh, for that uh, introduction. Now, uh, it's it's really hard to understand how we're going to have to adapt urban areas to deal with climate change without hearing from the people who are actually on the ground in the worst affected areas. So with this in mind, I want to introduce our first guest, and that is uh, Daffa Praditya. Now, Daffa, in our report, uh, you gave an account of what it's like to live in a city that is quite literally sinking due to sea level rise. Um, first of all, welcome, Daka. And, and secondly, could you tell us a little bit more about this, what's happening to your city, and share your question with our members? OK, thank you. Thank you very much uh, once again for the opportunity to speak here. And I'm so honored to be part of this research um, initiative. So yeah, as you know that uh, I'm currently living in Jakarta, one of the most uh, fastest shrinking cities in the world. And also, this is also stated by the US President Joe Biden has stated that Jakarta will be sinking by 2050. And it's so bad for our people. Be even like in the next year, in 2024, Jakarta is no longer the capital city of Indonesia. It will be moved to uh, the another a part of Indonesia, which is Nusantara. We call the new capital city is Nusantara, which is uh, located situated in Borneo Island. And that because of Jakarta now is no longer capable to be this capital city of Indonesia, we face a lot of climate crisis uh, uh, challenge, such as air pollution and also sea level rising. And yeah, as the people who live uh, studying and working here, um, I really face the, the crisis as I also have to face a lot of uh, things that related to the, to the climate crisis impact in here. And most of people here are really suffered and really worried about their future because they have to be displaced from the place where they, uh, they work, they go to school and so many things. So my question is um, actually like what are the most proper steps that we have to do in in dealing with this uh, climate crisis situation, especially in Jakarta, we face sinking as soon as possible, like it's very near. And what the government has to be done in order to respond to this, um, to, in, in order to respond to this climate crisis impact. So I think that's all my question is my statement. Thank you so much. Daffa, thank you so much um, for, for giving us an insight into what life is like for you and, and, the, and, and the rest of the people living in Indonesia. Um, I want to throw that question out to our to our panel. And I, I, I think I'll go to Alice Hill first of all. You know, Daffa mentioned a little bit about Joe Biden talking about, about the future of Indonesia. And we know other cities are moving in that direction. You in, in the US have had your own issues in Louisiana and, and New Orleans. You know, what do cities do? What do, and what do the leaders and governments have to do? What, what do they need to implement to, make, to, to help cities become more resilient in the future? Very simple place to start, a plan. And unfortunately, we do not have planning as uh, we've heard occurring universally across the world. Uh, it depends on resources and it also depends on willingness because when you're talking about telling people where and how they will live, uh, there can be a great deal of political resistance even among those who have the means to move. So uh, Indonesia has developed a plan and will uh, be moving to Borneo. That has been controversial as uh, has been mentioned by DAFA and others. But there is a plan. Now, what happens uh, to Jakarta, a city with a great cultural history uh, and of great uh, importance to the nation? 
Again, it's a matter of identifying the places that will be viable and those that will not be, and then uh, helping those in the areas that are not viable be able to move, and also helping those areas that uh, will receive more migrants, those displaced, to prepare. Bangladesh, interestingly, has done uh, very, probably among, in the world, the most forward-leaning work on this, identifying cities within Bangladesh where people can move in the event that they are displaced. And so supporting those cities, the cities that will see growth so that there's less conflict, affordable housing, livelihoods available for people to slip into once they arrive is very important. Mm. But planning is at a really nascent stage. I can speak certainly for the United States in many cities here. The mega cities, uh, New York, Los Angeles uh, have begun, but it's still a very difficult conversation because many people, cognitively, it's difficult for us to realize that this risk will materialize and will affect us personally. That's just uh, uh, human cognition, uh, the availability bias, and that makes it difficult for city planners willing to move forward to set the plans in place and have them, in fact, adopted. No, it's a, it's, it's a really great point, Alice, you know, having a plan, you know, having a plan, but acknowledging that you need a plan. I, I mean, coming from a sporting background, we have that same, which many of you may have heard, and that is um, failing to plan is 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 planning to fail. Do you know, do you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're not going to go anywhere unless you have a plan. Um, I want to just move on to Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh um, with, with, with this question as well. You know, from a social science perspective, how the governments get this messaging across because we're talking about cities we're talking about our personal spaces our lives and we're talking about change and we we all know these are things that humans and great masses of people struggle with how do governments get the messaging right um in order to bring the masses along yeah i think that's right i think you know some of the risks of climate change as we've been hearing are actually terrifying and they are existential threats to to many areas of the world um at the moment in many developed countries there is maybe a sense that this is a problem for the developing world or for somewhere someone somewhere far away we talk about psychological distance this feeling that it's it's yeah sure it's a threat but it's not a threat to me um and there is a sort of challenge with how to convey a risk without terrifying people and making them kind of switch off. Um, so the, the the balance is to be struck that conveying the, the seriousness of the risk, the fact that it is a relevant threat to you in ways that are going to resonate. So yes, it is relevant. It is going to affect things like food supplies. There will be migration. These are going to be parts of the world that we need to adapt our behavior to as well as, as other places. Um, but in a way that actually gets people to think they can do something about it. So this sense of so-called self-efficacy, I can do something. This is not so overwhelming that I, I'm just going to block it out. So it's conveying solutions and action strategies at the same time as talking about the risk. So that's the kind of crucial way that risks can be communicated uh, without actually just terrifying people and making them kind of bury their heads in the sand. So conveying the solution along with the risk so um giving people that sense of empowerment like they 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 are on this we're, we're on this journey together yeah I, I think is um is is what you're trying to say there oh I'd like to also hear from professor um she uh, uh about what can the rest of the world learn from what you're what you're doing in in China um in terms of because you're able to plan so far in advance um and and i think that's part of the key to your to your success you know what can you pass on to dafa and the indonesian um uh, government in order to, to to create um resilience for their city but china is very very different for a thousand years the uh china has been dealing with uh, all kind of natural disasters especially 
this weather uh, related natural disasters. And some say, uh, you know, just about 80 years ago, this uh, uh, German American uh, scholar, uh, Wittfel, the uh, Carl uh, August Wittfel, had uh, uh, this book. We're talking about in China, this, the whole state building thousands of years ago was based on fighting against flood. And this system has been developed over the centuries, even for the People's Republic of China some 70 some years ago, when, when it first started, the very first institution organization put together was this, uh, this general uh, di directorship on uh, prevention and uh, response to to uh, flood and uh, and drought, and that system has been over there uh, through, throughout the entire history of the People's Republic of China. is It is led by the vice premier, led by vice premier, and uh, they they have meetings regularly, especially when it comes to the, the rain season. We can see uh, so two months ago in, in uh, uh, July. 29th through uh, August the 2nd. And there is this major typhoon hit the, the, the southeastern coast, but they have this uh, uh, tele, tele connection and the typhoon skipped thousands of miles all the way down to Beijing and Hebei. And within just uh, two days, and uh, 1,000 millimeters of the rain just fall on the, uh, the, 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 the Taihang Mountains area and causing the major floods to, to cities south of Beijing and Hebei province. That, you know, uh, dozens of people died in, the, in that water, but it could, could really be worse. It could be really worse. When, you, when you're thinking about the rainfall for uh, just a couple of days, is that that's the twice as much of the annual precipitation in the region. So the region is really, really, really seen, you know, within the last 140 years, this is unseen, but this is becoming regular. This has become a lot more common in the area. So this system, when I look at it, this overall national system go, going from uh, crossing five levels of government from the central government to provinces, municipality, counties and township it, it actually worked it actually worked but the question is you know with this all threat from the climate change with this all threat of urbanization and uh, then you're, you're talk, talk you're, you're just talking about at the beginning you know both the frequency and the intensity has increased so much now with urbanization the exposure has changed so much you know 40 years ago, there was only 200 million people living in the cities. Now there are 900 million people living in the city within four, four, four decades. And 700 million of people now living in the cities. And the exposure and the properties, and look at, look at the, the cars and all sitting on, on the street, they all just uh, inundated because of this flood. So the, the question is, is the current governance system for flood and drought this kind of disaster can still work to can still deal with this the, this huge challenges you know with urbanization with climate change i think that that's the real really the real the real challenges so this uh, uh so to summarize i think china does have a system that has been working for a long time but now facing the new challenges and we really need to rethink and redevise, redevise, design this whole new governance system for, for these natural disasters and climate-related risks. Thank you, Professor Chi. So um, just in summary there um, from all our experts in terms of what, what needs to be done, it's, we're, we're talking about redesigning the way um, our governments think about how we um, create resilience and build cities. Uh, we need to create messaging that is empowering to, to the general public um, and that's inclusive. So it brings everyone along. And um, Alice Hill's very simple line of 
we need to have a plan. We need to have a plan. Um, thank you so much um, to our experts. Uh, and thank you, Daffa, um, for, for, your, for your great question as well. Let's turn now to our next guest, Rashetta Ozane. Um, Rashetta, um, thanks for being with us. And I understand it's uh, quite early for you where you are. So even more thanks to you for, for getting up so early um, to, to share your knowledge with us. Now, you work to help provide relief for those suffering from the devastating consequences of the climate crisis. Could you give us your perspective on, on, on what's happening in, in the climate crisis and the consequences, and also put your question uh, to our CCAG members? Good morning, all. My name is Rochetta Ozan, and I am the founder, director, and CEO of the Vessel Project of Louisiana. The Vessel Project of Louisiana is a small mutual aid organization um, that I founded after several natural disasters here in um, the state of Louisiana, starting with Hurricanes Laura and Hurricanes Delta um, three years ago. And in which I lost my home, I'm a single mom of six, and my children and I were uh, forced to live in a FEMA trailer, which is um, housing that the federal government issues out to folks who have lost their homes um, or their shelters due to um, climate-induced disasters. And so I want to apologize ahead of time because my five-year-old is here with me. We are waiting on the bus. That's why it looks like I'm in the dark. Um, his bus is going to pull up emo. I apologize if you hear him talk in the background, but that is the real life uh, Im uh, impacts of, you know, living on the front lines and working on the front lines and being a parent. So, um, okay. And so we, what we need to do is we need to emphasize, I'm just going to turn my camera off for a moment so that he doesn't distract you all. Um, we need to emphasize <laughs> that everyone knows how to respond to different emergencies that are happening due to these climate induced disasters that are particularly impacting and affecting low income uh, people of color because these are the communities that are overflowing with. Oh. Oh. I think we're having um, problems with Regetta's uh, mic and her connection. But um, yeah, look, I totally understand where you're coming from, Rosetta. I, I'm a father and um, it, it, it's not easy dealing with a child when you're trying to um, to work at the same time. But I, I, I've got your question here um, and you were sort of alluding to it a little bit in terms of how um, lower income people are affected um, the greatest by the climate crisis you know the, that and that's not um me that, that there's facts for that all over the all over the world you can see that it's literally the poorest and the most vulnerable who are being affected um the hardest by this and so um Rosetta's question is what does environmental justice mean to you um i want to throw that question over to professor mark mazanin um I feel like you may have something to say on this, Professor. Thank you, Ade. I mean, for me, environmental justice is making sure that as we transition to a cleaner and better world, it includes everyone. We don't just deal with the elites. And I think when it comes to cities, it's really important because that planning, planning, planning is so important because it's about thinking about the most vulnerable people in the cities. It's the people that live in the cheapest housing. It's the people that live right in the center who are most affected by the heat waves. And I'll give you a real example of where planning failed, but then was integrated. 2003 was the worst heat wave across Northern Europe. About 75,000 excess deaths because of that heat wave. And the worst affected area was Paris. The reason being is uh, lots of people leave Paris in August to go on holidays and the elderly relatives were left behind. 
and there was nobody checking on them. And so they lost a large number of their vulnerable and elderly population. And the French were absolutely shocked and devastated by this. And so they changed their planning. They now know where all their vulnerable people are. They now know how to contact them. They now know how to actually move them to air conditioned sort of like specialist centers if they need to. And it was shown that in the next heat wave, which occurred in 2007, they lost only a quarter of the people that they would have done if they hadn't instigated those change. So for me, it's always about cities and thinking about the poorest and the most vulnerable. And I think one of the key things is also, we know that uh, minorities are most affected by those problems, particularly things like air pollution, and they don't have access to all of the security that many of us have. So for me, think about the most vulnerable people, always. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Mark. And I think Rochetta would like to come back in. Yeah, I, I, I can see R R Rochetta there. Are you, um, are, is your connection back up, Rochetta, if, you, if you'd want to finish what you were saying? Yes, I'm so sorry about that interruption in the connection. Um, I hope that you all can hear me better now. Yeah. Um, I was just saying that, um, you know, here living along the Gulf Coast where we are overflowing with fossil fuel extractive industry and this president's administration continues to talk about climate resistant resilience, climate change, and caring about communities that are impacted, yet that same administration is also continuing to approve new fossil fuel infrastructure in those same communities it doesn't make any sense. And so when we're talking about environmental justice, we're talking about just as um, you said before me, thinking about the communities that are most impacted, making sure that those communities and those community members are a part of the conversation um, and not an afterthought, and bringing them to the table beforehand and asking them what their communities need to thrive, to be sustainable and to be resilient. We've had so many climate induced disasters here, as I was stating, from hurricanes to flooding and more recently, extreme heat and wildfires here in Louisiana. And so we know that climate change is real here um, in the South, in the Gulf South, and we have to start making the connection between what is happening in the Gulf South and how that directly impacts what's happening in the global South and how incorporating environmental justice principles into our work, thinking about the most vulnerable people, the lowest and the poorest, those at the bottom, if we think about them and how we can we can ready them for what's happening, what's um, coming and you know what's um, these impending changes uh, of the climate, if we can get those folks ready and then that will in turn make the entire world ready uh, for the impacts of climate change. And I just think that it is essential to acknowledge that the challenges that disproportionately affect Black communities in our state here in Louisiana, that environmental justice concerns are at the forefront here. And these communities often, as I stated, are the ones that are right next door to these petrochemical and LNG facilities and so when we're talking about moving entire communities, as uh, folks were stating earlier on the call, we're talking about moving cultures. We're talking about moving history. We're talking about moving families that have grown a bond and a connection with each other and asking them to go somewhere else and start all over when we can remedy the problem now. And so thank you all again for having me and allowing me to come back on. I am a single mom of six, and so sometimes it gets a bit chaotic, but they are the reason why I am doing this. I'm a real person living in the community. There are more than 12 petrochemical facilities in my neighborhood, um, three LNG facilities, new proposed projects. We just got approved for this big direct air capture hub. I've heard you all uh, talk about New Orleans. I do live in Louisiana, but I don't live in New Orleans. I live three hours from New Orleans. And so the city of New Orleans is not the only place here um, in Louisiana that's being impacted. I, I challenge anyone on the call, anyone listening far and wide to come here 
to the Gulf South, come to the Louisiana Gulf Coast and visit and see what we're dealing with. We promise to feed you some good food and to show you some good Southern hospitality. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, Rajetta. I'm so glad uh, we were able to get you back on and, and to give you that voice and that platform. And um, yes, I, I would definitely accept that um, invitation to come to Louisiana. I mean, you had me at food. I I, I want to go to um, Alice Hill here. Um, you know, being from the States, being on the Council on, on Foreign Relations, Rajetta made some really good points there, you know, about how the most vulnerable are being affected. And, and one, one of the problems I feel is, is, is a big issue here is that, yes, the most vulnerable, the poorest, often black people are being affected the most, but the people who have the power to make these changes are being affected the least. So how can we, uh, how can we incentivize? What is it that needs to happen to make the people with power uh, especially in the USA, make that difference, make those changes that are going to help people like Rajetta and her community? It's an excellent question, uh, and it gets to building trust. And the way you build trust uh, in this context is typically through meeting face to face. And I think, as Rajetta said, it means that any plan uh, includes in the planning process uh, those that are most affected. Uh, but what we find is because it's uh, quicker to create a plan without input that those in power sometimes move ahead. And that is to the great detriment to those who um, are deeply affected and often don't have as uh, large a um, spot uh, in uh, the decision making process. So Louisiana is actually an interesting example of inclusive planning, because after the Gulf oil spill, of course, uh, Rochetta is talking about uh, all the petrochemical facilities there, unfortunately, there's spills. Uh, and those, of course, affect greatly the communities that are living right next to them uh, and uh, come at a great cost as well to uh, the environment. But after the uh, BP oil spill, uh, Louisiana got um, a, a great a large amount of money uh, from BP oil. And it took, as I recall, about $50 million to engage in an extensive planning process. Hundreds of meetings were held across Louisiana. Uh, a number of parishes opted into the planning process and they created a master plan. Really in the United States, it's an example of, of one of the most comprehensive planning processes we've seen for dealing with, in their case, sea level rise. And in that plan, they identified certain communities that would, um, because of subsidence from uh, naturally occurring, but also oil extraction, as well as sea level rise, some areas where uh, the seas will rise and they won't be saved. And they began the discussion of what are we going to do? Now, of course, when you create a plan, then you have to implement it. And implementation of these plans is very costly. So that is the next barrier. How do you uh, have the sufficient funds to do what communities have agreed upon is uh, in their best interest. And it's also costly to include and be as inclusive, but that's what we need to do to have a plan that people uh, may not entirely agree with, but at least they felt like they have been heard and considered and are part of the plan. The, the, the plan may be costly, um, including people may be costly, um, but the cost of not having the plan would be unthinkable. Well said, far better than I could say, but that was my point, is yeah. we have to include everyone. Nothing decided without them uh, is that what, in, in a different community that gets excluded, those uh, people with disabilities uh, often feel that uh, they aren't included. And when you're talking about flooding in Louisiana, Raising a house by 20 feet so the water can wash underneath is a very difficult decision for somebody with a disability that essentially traps them in their home. Yeah, for some, I, I, as a wheelchair user, I can attest to that. You know, um, 
And I, I think one of the things that excites me about um, the city's report and how we can build cities of the future is it's an opportunity almost for us to start again and create a plan that includes everyone. Because the cities that we currently have right now were cities built uh, or designed hundreds of years ago, and they only they were designed for a small specific group of people. Now's our chance to rewrite those things and rewrite and build a world that is for everyone. And that's where the trust will come from. You know, that's where people will feel included. Um, and that's how we can bring everyone along. Um, but listen, and I'm, that's where the hope comes from, too. Exactly. That there's something for everyone here. Exactly. It's not about losing. It's about gaining. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you um, very much, Rochetta. Um, that was a really, really good contribution, an important contribution. Um, and I hope we can get you back on um, in, in the future to hear what you're uh, more about what you're doing in Louisiana. Um, I'm going to now turn to Sada Sh Shafikul Alam. Sada, you spoke in our report on how the city of Dakar is exploring new measures to de deal with sea level rise. Now, um, could you speak to us a little bit more about this and also give us your question to our CCAG uh, experts? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something about my city's Dakar. I used to live in Dakar since last uh, 35 years. And before that, I have frequently visited that city. In the day, Dhaka is the capital city of Bangladesh, is uh, frequently affected by the different climatic disasters, like flood. Due to flood, there is a water logging, long-term water logging also, and the heat wave, heat stress also, is the new urban uh, disaster here. And this city is a, the, beside the climatic disaster, the city has a, another problem with the population pressure. In the, our city, Dhaka city is the highest densely populated city among all of the cities in the world. And its population growth is also uh, highest uh, among all other cities in the world. If you look at the uh, statistics from the city growth, then you will find it. And the, the, prop, the but our city has some good example about to make it flood free. I, I already mentioned in the report that the, the city has a flood protection embankment. Actually, the flood protection embankment was built after the severe flood in 1981. There was a severe flood, and the major part of the city was inundated due the, with the river flood. And after that, there are several uh, water uh, flood due to storm water surge. In, in, and the mo uh, most majority part of the city was inundated. But now, if for last uh, several years, the city is uh, almost flood free due to the construction of uh, flood protection embankment and pump out the water from the city to outside the uh, embankment. So uh, in that case, the city is, in the capital city is uh, now flood free, we can say, but in the future, if there is a more sea level rise, then the, the fl river flood water will be stagnant and the city will be uh, impacted in the flood again. So the, the, still, we cannot say the city is resilient for a long time, maybe a short time, uh, we can say is the a climate adaptive and in to uh, and the to uh, reduce the population pressure in cities uh, in uh, the civil society organization research organization and government we have some initiative we are un undertaking that to build a uh, climate resilient secondary cities as migrant friendly so uh, with this uh, vision uh, we are conducting a research and we we are giving our information to the uh, policy makers to through the policy uh, uh, policy brief and we organize the dialogue on national level and regional level to share our experience so how can build the smaller secondary cities and towns as a climate resilient as well as migrant friendly you know the why do we need to migrant friendly cities the most of the climate affected people from the rural to the move to the capital city in dhaka so the population pressure is increasing but if we can, if we are not able to reduce the population pressure in Dhaka, maybe in future, it, the city already, we, we told that it's, it's not a livable city. It will be unlivable in future. So at that time, we have a uh, 329 municipality and 12 city corporation uh, beyond the uh, Dhaka city. We can uh, use the uh, district level headquarters and mun uh, municipalities 
uh, or the sub-district level uh, uh, towns uh, to make, if we can make migrant friendly and make the climate resilient, that could be a better option for us to reduce the pressure of the Dhaka city. And we, we are now working on that and government is supporting for that. We are conducting reports and some donors are uh, providing support to conduct the piloting activity in the area. That's that's the uh, good thing that we are doing. But still, uh, I am not sure whether that, that will be the long term uh, resilience activity or, or in our country uh, for the cities because the um, majority of the uh, uh, the coastal region of our city of uh, our country is the less than six meter uh, above the sea level rise. If, if, if the sea level rise gone up and up, there will be many cities will be inundated with the sea, uh, sea level. Even the our capital city will be impacted. So in that sense, uh, I I have some question. Uh, I ask uh, several times with, to me, and also I like to ask the learned expert here. Uh, what are the key factors required to establishing required and unplanned cities? You know, the our cities mostly in the unplanned city. What uh, are the key factors required to establish resilience? in our city like not only on our city the other unplanned city you can say the uh, unplanned city you need to make a plan but for making a plan is the poor, poor county is not the easy thing and it, it, you cannot do it rapidly it takes long time now it, so how we can tackle these things how we can uh how we can build the uh, our city's resilience and climate migrant friendly for this particularly for the secondary cities and towns that's my question it's a great question, Sada, and um, you know it's an important question coming from a, a region of the world that's been impacted by climate change so heavily. And sea level rise is is the big the big issue, I think, with so many cities. And your question was that: What are the key factors required to establish resilience in an unplanned city? And there are so many cities like that. When you look at somewhere like Dakar, you look at places like Delhi or Mexico de Efe or, or Lagos, these are cities, but on their outskirts, they become sprawling. And on the outskirts, you have other unplanned cities that grow from them. You know, So we talk about having a plan, but that plan tends to be there for the cities that have been planned. But what about the cities that just come up through population growth. Um, I want to throw that question to, to Sir David King, actually, um, first. Yeah, what, what, what would you say we can look to in the report that will deal with these unplanned cities that can help them create more resilience for the future? Eddie, thank you so much for putting this to me, but I'm going to have to say there is no general solution the main thing is, and I'm going to repeat what Alice has said, we need each city to have a plan. And even these unplanned cities, we, we say they're unplanned. It's re really interesting to examine uh, the cities in East Africa, for example, that have sprawled. Nevertheless, in that sprawl, what you see emerging are social systems that actually work for the people living in them. And every city needs a plan based on the challenges of future climate change, whether it's temperature rise or sea level rise. Sea level rise is the biggest challenge right now. But the, the cities need to understand that they do have social operations in these sprawls uh, and need to work with the people living in them. And I, I don't think there's a, a more important message. Don't sail in with a solution from outside the city engage with the urban people living in that city that to me is the most important issue I, I would say the same with giving advice to any country on operating its economy get in there work with the local people see that you're not imposing a western irrelevant solution into these parts of the world talk to them they know their city, they know how to live in it as it is, and they're the ones who can plan a future. That's a really good answer. And I think um, it's one of the biggest mistakes we've made in so many things um, when we're trying to create so many solutions. Um, Alice alluded to it earlier, and that is creating trust by working with the locals, working with the people who it affects directly, and also learning from them. 
You know, just because we're living in our high ivory towers and and we and we're so some of some of our leaders are seen as the so-called elite, doesn't mean that we have all the answers. You know, we need to 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 open our minds um, and and deal with this together. Um, that's the only way we're going to get out of this climate crisis. Now, um, Sada, thank you so much for that question. And thank you so much for giving us an overview of, of, of what's happening in your part of the world. I just want to move on quickly because time is against us. And uh, I want to now move to, uh, to Rasmus. And I want to get a, a better sense of how the financial and regulatory instruments can help ensure our cities are fit for the climate crisis. Um, so Rasmus, Gross and Olsen from Urban Partners, um, you supported our city's report. Could you tell us how Urban Partners are working in this area? And I also believe you've got a question for our members today. So please do share this with the panel and welcome. Thank you. And thank you for having us. Um, uh, I would say that, and thank you for also having the uh, capabilities to contribute to this very, very uh, important uh, report. I would say uh, from our perspective and being urban partners and being a, an urban space investment house with a, a, an annual, a annual asset under management on 20 billion euros, we, we would like to be perceived as the constructive capital partners for cities uh, because we really believe that if we really cut to the core, the root of many of these problems in climate change, they are due to the, to the lack of decarbonizations of real estate and the urban space. So we really believe that uh, the triangulation between constructive capital, transparency, and, and transparent framework conditions and building codes can really cater for much more faster and, 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 um, and efficient uh, uh, fight against climate change. Because we truly believe that the most effective tool, uh, tools we have at our disposal in the fight against climate change is mobilizing capital allocations and financing in towards the most decarbonized assets. And the piece that we allude to in the report is that uh, there are actually frameworks uh, and, and, and pathway to secure transparency for the financial institutions to drive capital and finance towards decarbonized assets. So we really want to, to see that regulation is good and can cater for transparency, but we are very much in a hurry now. We, you all alluded to all these horrifying climate change impacts all over the world. And if how we structured our economies, we need to take in the, the fact that we also see now that it is a good business case to actually de-risk assets from a decarbonized perspective. So for us, in order to deliver resilience and risk-adjusted returns, to our investors, we can now see that a clear decarbonized asset is also a de-risked asset from an economic perspective, and hence it's also a good business case. So we we really don't see it, it get like opposites to do good and also do well on, on the commercial side of things, because now uh, these are clear incentives that could be aligned. And we really believe that governments, you all, all of you said, having a plan is very <laughs> important. We believe that the, the city role is to have carbon limits in building codes, have transparency through building certification, and et cetera, to actually cater for the broader value chain in, in the urban space to, to take action in a scientific substantial manner. So that's also why we, we really believe that, that capital and finance has a crucial uh, accelerator and skeletal role in this piece. So, so I would say that uh, this is uh, our perspective and uh, we will be very, very much uh, eager to hear how we could help and get input from you guys from this perspective, because we really believe that by solving these systemic problems and decarbonize the urban space and also make more affordable housing and so on and all this on the social dilemma, how can we then uh, cater our operations to, to support you guys? That's basically the mission of, of urban partners to to, to uh, really, really move the needle beyond our own portfolios, beyond our, our own investments, but really cater for this desperately needed systemic change in, in the global real estate space. Um, re thank you so much, Rasmus. Um, to some interesting points, because you know, you could, if you, if you wanted to delve deeper, it, it say that uh, a big part of the reason why we're in the climate crisis is because of the acquisition and mobilization of capital. Um, but now we're also saying that the mobilization of capital is the solution um, it, or could be the solution. 
Um, I, 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 and I find that a really interesting proposition. And you're probably right. We're not going to be able to get out of this without the private sector. Um, I feel I, I, I'm going to put this question into to our panel, and uh, which is like, how can private companies best support cities dealing with the with, with their climate uh, um, adaptation and, and mitigation challenges? And um, what types of public private partnerships uh, do we think are needed? Um, who, who who's happy to take on that question here? Um, yeah, so the Dave, so Dave King has got his hand up. I like that. Thank you, David. So, <clears throat> Adia, I think I just want to say a word about Urban Partners because they're an exemplary company. This is a company that set itself out on a trajectory that actually looked impossible from a financial point of view when they set out in the sense that putting up buildings that are net zero emissions in their construction and in their living patterns inevitably tends to look more expensive than alternative buildings. And of course, the running costs are lower, but most people don't take those into account. And I think many people wrote urban partners off. Now, what you've just heard is that they have something like 20 billion euro invested now. This is a, a vastly successful company, one of the most successful companies in Denmark today and also in Europe. So what, what we're seeing here is Urban Partners showing the way forward to others. Please, they're saying, and I think I'm going to reflect this exactly, don't follow the development of stranded assets. Stranded mm. assets are assets that you put in, you invest in thinking this is the cheapest way forward that become much more expensive because they're not fit for purpose in the future. Anything that we now construct in infrastructure terms that is not fit for purpose in the future becomes a stranded asset. So it becomes a very poor investment, even if it looks at the time as if it's the best way forward. Now, that's a critically important message but for the financial sector, a difficult message. All I want to say is there's urban partners. They've given the example and we need other private sector companies to understand this example and to follow suit. And then we all benefit from having a future that is properly planned and properly financed. Brilliant, brilliant. Professor Mark Maslin, how do we, um, you know, <laughs> We, we talk about stranded assets and um, it keeps making me think of the Rosebank oil um, refinery that we, that's recently been talked about here in the UK. Um, and yeah, we often talk as well in, in the UK and, and sorry if it sounds like it's been UK centric, but I'm going from the, the, the place that I know. Um, but we often talk about following the example of Denmark and saying, and, and of Scandinavian countries yeah, you know, but the the talk, the action doesn't match the talk. There is a disconnect there. There is a cognitive dissonance. So yes, I think business is is really important, and business and the private sector can can play a part. But how do we make sure this role is effective, and how do we make sure that it's not all talk and more action? So I think this is the critical question for the next decade, and it is really down to governments. Um, I love the Al Gore quote from yesterday where he said, oil companies seem to be better at capturing politicians than they are at dealing with emissions. And I think that's really important. And what we're finding is that even though hard-nosed economists go, renewables, they're safe, they're cheap, and guess what? They have security because you don't actually have to sort of uh, uh, worry about volatile markets. But our politicians seem to be in love with fossil fuels. So I think what we need is uh, a groundswell to push it back against those politicians and say, no, I'm sorry, we want to clean a better world. And I think that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are many countries that have incredibly good regulation. And I think we can share those good examples around the world. However, I will pick up on examples, for example, the UK and the US, where there are very good rules, but there's not enforcement. 
So I think when we have a partnership and we basically do need that dynamicism of the private sector because they get things done. You know, you give them a target, they'll do it. Brilliant. OK, but you need to basically give them sort of the incentive, but you also need to give them the rules and regulations and then you need to check on them. And I think that's important. And if we get that together, then, of course, governments and the private sector can work very, very well together. And there are many examples of really good infrastructure projects around the world which have been done in partnership. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Professor Mark Maslin. And Rasmus, um, thank you for your question. And please, let's keep nurturing this relationship. I, I, I think I agree, wholeheartedly agree with what Sir David King said. You know, our relationship with you at Urban Partners is so important and the work that you're doing is so, so important. So yeah, keep it up and let's keep communicating. Um, thank you. To, thank you, Rasmus. Now, thank you to all our guests and the CCAG panel. Um, that's all we have time today. I hope today's session has worked for you. And, and I hope you found it insightful. If you're interested in learning more about the topics we've discussed today, then head over to CCAG's website, ccag.earth, where you can find our latest report, Risk and Resilience, the role of cities in tackling the climate crisis. Trust me, look, it's, it's pretty dense. There's a lot of information in this, but it, I think it's one of the most powerful and one of the most important reports that we've ever put out. So if there's anything that you can do in your spare time that I think will be useful, it's reading this report. Listen, please share this video and its messages with your network because knowledge is the key to ending the climate crisis. See you next month.